I'd like, next like to introduce Dr. Eric Laux, who's the director of the Mindfulness Center at Brown. And he, um, at Brown, he does wonderful research to look at mindfulness and the health effects. Um, and two very important areas that he's studied are in undergraduate populations and in individuals with hypertension. So he's conducted randomized control trials to look at how mindfulness can help uh, individuals and public health overall. So thank you for coming. Hello, uh, really a pleasure to be here today. I just wanna thank everyone who's worked so hard uh, to bring this to us today, um, including uh, Diane and Saul, who were speakers at the last Spirit of the Scientist retreat. And I think there's a lot of humbleness for them not speaking today, but yet um, their talks were really remarkable in the last one. And to all the monastics and everyone behind the scenes putting this together. Um, you know, I think as scientists, we were encouraged uh, to bring the retreat experience into our talk. Um, and so uh, one of the pieces that was resonating with me with the retreat experience and also being at Dartmouth College uh, amongst the mountains and the forests um, is the value of uh, physical movement. Um, we had uh, Fab Lou, for example, yesterday uh, guiding us in 10 different mindful movements uh, that I, uh, I think introduced to the community. Uh, we did walking meditations, in, including uh, just recently. Um, and so maybe even if we think um, back to the walking meditation that we did uh, just a little while ago, for those of you who were on it, um, maybe even just connecting to notice how you felt after the walking meditation compared to before. And uh, if you felt generally better after the walking meditation compared to before, raise your hand. And, uh, and then if you went on the walking meditation, if you felt uh, about the same afterwards as you did before, raise your hand. And then if you went on the walking meditation, if you felt actually a little worse after uh, compared to before and again, whatever your experience is is welcome to uh, raise your hand. So in this case, everyone uh, raised their hand for feeling better afterwards. And uh, it's, um, <laughs> who's that guy? <laughs> It's a common, common enough experience, uh, including people going through our mindfulness-based blood pressure reduction program. Maybe if you think about just the moment before you started, when we were invited to go on the walking meditation, you're thinking about putting on your coat and going outside, it's a little chilly, but maybe you're feeling interested in the activity, maybe raise your hand um, if, as you heard that you were about to do walking meditation outside, if you had a little bit of aversion towards it, like you weren't so excited if you, you, yeah, okay. And then raise your hand if when you heard about the walking meditation outside, you're pretty neutral, whatever. Yeah. And then raise your hand when you heard about the walking meditation, getting ready to do it, you felt like positive affect, like feeling pretty good. Yeah, so pretty broad mix across those. And that's also common that we see around physical activity, for example, where just about everybody feels good afterwards. Uh, but it's a mix about how we feel just beforehand. Um, and so with our mindfulness-based blood pressure reduction program, we talk about how there's as many ways to move as there are people in the world. And uh, so for example, Joe, um, who was a retired engineer who went through one of our mindfulness-based blood pressure reduction programs, um, I've kept in touch with him over the years. And a couple of years after the program, he had a, a thigh injury. And he was someone who really enjoyed long walks, like he'd do a few miles a day. And in response to the thigh injury, he, he worked to care for it, but it was a long-term injury. And uh, he noticed in the process that he'd spent more of his life working on strengthening his lower body than his upper body. And so he started to take that moment to start to strengthen more of his upper body and started doing push-ups every morning, for example, and working on his lower back. And, and he was a new grandfather, and he would uh, drive up to Vermont regularly enough to care for his new grandson, and found that on those days that he was caring for his grandson, his back hurt quite a bit because <laughs> he was carrying around so much. And when he started to do the upper body work, he was able to care for his grandson better and be in less pain. And uh, with the help of his wife, he went to physical therapy and found the mindful movements through the physical therapy, and then his thigh started to heal. And so he responded to that moment in his life and the conditions that were to be able to move uh, in a way that best matched reality. 
And so that's a question of, you know, if there are as many ways to move as there are people in the world, what is, what is your way? Uh, and so I would even uh, invite you to take a moment where we'll do a little, little bit of a contemplation to just um, even consider what, what is your favorite way to move in this moment in your life? Uh, you know, for example, is it uh, something playful like pickleball or tennis with friends or uh, maybe is it something practical like my father who, you know, really works in the yard and mows the lawn and prunes the trees and cuts the wood in the forest and hauls it up to heat our home in the winter? Or, or is it something maybe on your own to have a more contemplative experience maybe in the woods with awe around nature? And so even if you like taking a moment to close the eyes most of the way, if you like, and just consider at this moment in your life, what is your most favorite way to move? knowing it may well be unique from anyone else in here or anyone else in the world. And then as you're considering what that favorite way to move is, just taking a moment to consider just before that movement, you know, imagine yourself being about to do that particular movement, what's being experienced in the body or the physical sensations as you're getting ready to do that particular movement. even thinking about the emotional tone as you're getting ready, even envisioning yourself getting ready to do that particular movement, what kind of feeling tones are there? Is it excitement, for example, or some agitation? Even if it is our favorite, doesn't mean it's always easy to start. And then also noticing what's present often in the thoughts as we're getting ready to do that particular movement that we enjoy enjoy the most. doesn't mean we enjoy it all that mo much, but it's the one we enjoy the most of all the options. So what kind of thoughts are there? And then if you shift, imagining yourself actually doing the movement itself, so you're actually in the flow of that movement. What kind of sensations are there in the body, the emotions, the thoughts, as you're actually engaging in that activity? And then as you consider it just after the physical activity is done, what is often being sensed in the body, emotions, thoughts, after that physical activity is complete. And then allowing the eyes to open as you're ready as that meditation comes towards a close. And, and so part of what we learn about in the mindfulness arena is how the present moment is influenced by prior moments, including, say, the movement that we've had or maybe what we've eaten or uh, how much alcohol we drank last night. For example, all these things can influence the prior moment. And so when we think about um, you know, some of the things that have been talked about, including actually by Sarah earlier, uh, around the four foundations of mindfulness, this is an arc that we bring participants through in the mindfulness-based blood pressure reduction program. What I just offered actually is one of the contemplations that are active uh, that I was actually just leading last week in class. Um, and so one of the things that we're connecting in with around physical activity is the sensations in the body. And so how is the body uh, feeling when we do the particular movements and also how can we care for the body and all the limitations it may have uh, to be able to maximize the enjoyment uh, but also to care for it. We'll then connect in with the uh, feeling tones or the vedana. These are often uh, feeling tones like, um, does the physical activity generally feel positive? Uh, does it generally feel negative or does it feel pretty neutral? Uh, and so we're connecting in with that, along with connecting in with the mind, uh, or as uh, John was sharing in his talk last night with the Chinese character uh, for mindfulness, um, but it's really the heart-mind complex. So it's the connection of the mind with the heart in a lot of ways. And, and so maybe we're noticing, uh, for example, uh, around physical activity, do we have some sort of aversion to it? Uh, or do we have some sort of like attachment or craving, maybe for a sedentary behavior, like maybe just streaming a show instead of going to get some physical activity? Or do we maybe have some sort of delusion or ignorance around elements of physical activities that's actually getting in the way of us caring for our body uh, through physical activity. 
And then the third one um, it can be translated as dharma, mindfulness of dharma, or truth is another way of bringing into it. Um, Jack Cornfield has described it as the elements and patterns that make up experience. So say, for example, we talked about the Four Noble Truths a little bit. So around physical activity, you know, if physical activity uh, can, if we don't have enough of it, it can lead to some dukkha or some suffering or some unsatisfactoriness. And so if, say we don't, haven't yet optimized our physical activity, there might be some suffering there. Maybe it's some low back pain, for example, for not having the kind of core muscles to be able to support the back um, or other elements. And so we can know that suffering is there and then look at the sources of it, uh, that we're in a time in society right now where uh, it's really easy to be sedentary. Uh, we have washing machines and dishwashers and running water and we don't have to do the hunting and gathering to get our food. And uh, so we're at a moment in history where we have pretty sedentary jobs, a lot of us too, and we can't help but live in this moment in history, this little flash of time. But we can bring our wisdom to this moment and look at how to skillfully respond. And so that's uh, the third noble truth is there's usually a path out of the suffering. And so what is our wisdom sharing with us is that path out. And maybe it's related to the noble eightfold path around the right view, say around physical activity or right action, say around physical activity. So those are some of the ways that we can start to bring together some of uh, the Buddhist elements with say, in this case, physical activity. And so when we developed the mindfulness-based blood pressure reduction program, we uh, decided to you know, focus on blood pressure itself uh, because it's a, qu it's a quantitative outcome um, and many things flow into it. And so these are major drivers of blood pressure, like physical activity, obesity, diet, alcohol use, stress reactivity, medication adherence. I'm focusing a lot on physical activity today just because it um, was sort of a theme that came up uh, in the retreat. Um, and so what I've been talking a little bit about is self-awareness of how the body and mind feel before, during, and after physical activity. We do the same, we do the same around food, do the same around alcohol consumption, the same around stress reactivity. Um, and then it's one thing to have insights, say, around how, what are the causes and conditions for optimal physical activity, and it's another to actually act on those insights. And that's where uh, meditation training can come in, where we're training ourselves to place our mind where we choose to place it. So if an insight arises, are we able to actually act on it and to be able to bring our mind into the next action that our wisdom is sharing? It could be whether it's to, say, engage in that favorite form of physical movement of whatever it is along with training ourselves in emotion regulation so that, say, if um, a stressor arises where we might, you know, and just kind of click onto our social media or something to kind of <laughs> distract away, or could we maybe go for a walk in nature uh, that would care for our body and our mind uh, so that we may find healthier ways to regulate our emotions. So we bring people through an eight-week program that's grounded in mindfulness-based stress reduction, but has specific elements, including physical activity movements and some of the contemplations I've offered around with changes in diet and other things too. And, and so, um, you know, with the theme on, on physical activity and also s sedentary behavior, with our, uh, this is one of our randomized controlled trials, about 201 participants, where those who went through the mindfulness-based blood pressure, oh, sorry, uh, reduction program had a, you know, significant reduction in uh, the number of sitting minutes per week, about 400 minutes uh, went down, significant difference between that and the health education control group. Uh, we also looked at cardiovascular health, uh, and so this is uh, the American Heart Association's guidance on not only just preventing cardiovascular disease, but how do we actually foster flourishing in these eight different domains around diet and physical activity, glucose regulation, healthy weight and sleep, getting enough sleep, and avoiding nicotine exposure, having good blood pressure and blood cholesterol. So we had six out of eight of these uh, measures. Uh, we didn't take blood samples, so we didn't have the uh, blood glucose or the lipids, um, but we had blood pressure and weight and sleep duration and diet, physical activity, and smoking. And so we created, uh, using the American Heart Association guidelines, we created an overall cardiovascular health score that was basically standardized means of each of those six different components. And we found that together they added up into significant improvements in cardiovascular health as a whole. And, uh, and what we found is everything improved a little bit other than smoking. There were only three smokers out of the 201, so that didn't change. But people started sleeping about 20 minutes more on average. They started walk, the equivalent of walking at a moderate pace about half an hour extra a day. Their blood pressure came down about six millimeters of mercury. Uh, their dietary improvement improved about one extra fruit and vegetable a day, for example. And it all added up into significant improvements overall. 
Um, and we also look at you know the mind and the body connected to each other so that mindfulness training can help with depression symptoms directly, but also our physical activity influences our mood, as does our diet, actually. And so we found that although we didn't recruit people based on their depression symptoms, everyone's somewhere on the continuum of depression symptom ontology and found significant improvements in depression symptoms in those going through the mindfulness-based blood pressure reduction program. But interestingly, and I know one of our speakers will be talking about this um, kind of thing a little bit later, but we looked at also exposure to early life adversity and how Ty uh, wrote a book called Reconciliation about how to heal the past and the present moment. And so even for participants who say had exposure to early childhood neglect uh, from their parents, they actually improved more in their depression symptoms compared to those that didn't have exposure to neglect. And there's been other studies that have also looked at exposure to childhood abuse, uh, including with mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, finding that those with ex exposure to childhood abuse often do better with mindfulness training than those who didn't around depression symptoms. And so, again, as we're kind of looking at the connection of the mind and the body and how all these elements are often interwoven and interconnected, uh, we could see some of the impacts uh, there of healing the past and the present moment. Uh, so, um, oh, and we did see differences in blood pressure. I thought I'd just show that just because it is a mindfulness-based blood pressure reduction program. So <laughs> if you're wondering, uh, it did bring blood pressure down about six millimeters of mercury and about a five millimeter drop uh, translates into about a 10% drop in cardiovascular events like heart attacks and strokes. Um, so overall, uh, you know, I think uh, for me, um, being on this retreat and actually being a member of the Plum Village uh, community as well, I feel like it's really helped both my body uh, and my mind. And uh, I thought I'd just offer us a deeper dive into the impacts of mindfulness training, particularly on physical activity, but also how it's related uh, to cardiovascular health and even mental well-being too. So thank you. Just thank you to our funders, and if you want any more information on this, uh, there's a link for that too. So thank you.